Welcome everybody. Um, my name is Lisa Walker and I'm going to talk to you today about genetics and medical education. My talk will be divided into three main areas, um, clinical genetics and cancer genetics, genetics in the context of medical education and how that's really changed in the last 20 years. And then just a few thoughts at the end about medical education in Oxford. So I realised that many of you will not have met me, so I thought I'd just spend a slide introducing myself. Um, I started life at the University of Manchester, um, where I did an undergraduate degree in biochemistry. I then came to Oxford um, to do my DPhil in what was then the Institute of Molecular Medicine, it's now known as the WIM. And then I went to medical school. Um, graduated in 1999, and as you can see from the slide, um, I wasn't here in Balliol. I was at Oriel and then at Magdalen. After graduating, um, I undertook postgrad training in paediatrics in London, and then continued in London um, to start my specialist training in clinical genetics, before moving to Cambridge for further training in cancer genetics. I returned to Oxford in 2007 um, as a consultant in clinical genetics, specialising in cancer genetics, and then was awarded my fellowship here in Balliol um, in 2012, having worked as a college lecturer here in Balliol for several years. So what do I do all day? Um, well, I'm a consultant in cancer genetics, and what I'm showing you on this slide is the typical sort of pedigree we might see in the field of cancer genetics. I realise many of you will not be used to looking at pedigrees. So just to orientate you, um, circles are females, squares are males. If you're coloured in, you've had something. And if you're crossed out, you are deceased. So you can see from this pedigree, we have um, two individuals with breast cancer at young ages, one of whom is a male, and two individuals with ovarian cancer. Why is Angelina Jolie on this slide? Well, Angelina Jolie is interesting. She was single-handedly responsible for the near collapse of most medical genetics departments here in the UK and also um, overseas. This was back in 2013 when she went public about the fact that she carries a mutation in one of the breast cancer genes and that she had had risk reducing surgery. What Angelina did was brilliant in many ways because what she did was to make people take notice of what their family history is. We had people coming along to our department who had never been anywhere near a geneticist. And many people's lives are, have probably been saved as a direct result of what Angelina Jolie did. My other role is that I'm fellow and tutor in medical sciences um, here in Balliol. Um, I'm going to show you these pictures again a bit later on. But for me, my, my role here in Balliol is essentially all about the students. So I thought I'd put pictures of them up at this point. So how has clinical genetics evolved over the last 20 years? Well, clinical genetics can really be divided into four main areas. Dysmorphology, fetal medicine, neurogenetics, and cancer genetics. And what I'm gonna tell you about today is really the advances in dysmorphology and cancer genetics. So what's dysmorphology? Well, my husband's a haematologist and they have a field of haematology which is known as morphology. Begs the question a little bit, what on earth is dysmorphology? Well, if you look it up in a medical dictionary, you will find this. The study of human gen congenital malformations, birth defects, particularly those affecting the anatomy, the morphology of the individual. But what's really the working, de working definition um, if you're a clinical geneticist? Well, according to um, Helen Firth and Jane Hurst's um, clinical genetics book published in 2005, 
Dysmorphology is a term used to describe children whose physical features are not usually found in a child of the same age or ethnic background. So I'm going to introduce you to these three children. It's important to say at this point that in all the cases that I'm going to show today, um, there is consent for teaching and publication. So I'd like you to just have a bit of a think about what you can see in the features of these three kids that makes them properly dysmorphic. Well, here are the features. Um, you can see that they have very unusual eyebrows. They have long palpable fissures. They have quite a broad nasal root. Particularly on the one on this side, you can see quite marked synophorus here. And on the one over here, you can see that she has a low hanging columella on her nose. And again, moving back to this one, she has very widely spaced teeth, even for a child of this age. Looking at these pictures, I think that this little girl also has really quite low set ears. It is said in dysmorphology that if you draw a line from the outside point of your eye horizontally, you are supposed to hit some part of your ear. And I think we can safely say that in this little girl, even though she's looking upwards, you probably don't. So I think her ears are quite low set. So what I want to try and think about is how these little girls would have been investigated 20 years ago and how they'd be investigated now. Sidney Brenner, the very famous geneticist, once said that progress in science depends on new techniques, new discoveries and new ideas, probably in that order. And so it's important really to think about how these kids would have been investigated back in 1999. Well, initially what we would have done is to look at their chromosomes. What you can see in the picture at the top here is a metaphase spread. And you can see that we have all the 46 chromosomes there visible to the naked eye. They have been stained with a dye called GEMSA, which is what causes the characteristic light and dark bands visible on the chromosomes. Interestingly, the dark bands are areas of the chromosomes that are not usually actively transcribed, whereas the light bands are more open chromatin, where um, more active transcription usually takes place. You can see from this that the resolution is not very good. This is five to 10 megabytes of DNA. The technique that I've illustrated at the bottom is called FISH, fluorescence in situ hybridization. And it makes for very pretty pictures on slides, obviously. But what you can see here is that you can probe chromosomes. This is again, a metaphase spread just like this one, showing the chromosomes. And you can see little red areas and green areas at the top and the bottom of this particular chromosome. And what's happened here is that we've applied fluorescent probes to chromosomes looking for regions that we're particularly interested in. This technique doesn't really help you with our dysmorphic kids unless you know what it is that you're looking for. So you can, you can test specific regions of chromosomes for deletions and duplications. What you can see from this though, is that the resolution has improved massively. We're now down to 150 to 200 kilobases. Around 2005, um, a new technique started to come on stream for the um, investigation of dysmorphic children. This was a technique originally used in cancer genetics because we know that the genomes of cancers can be pretty wild and wacky. And so the technique was really originally um, developed to try and assess what was going on in cancer genomes. But you can 
In, we, you can use this to investigate dysmorphic kids. And what you do is to take patient DNA, which you label with a red dye, and control DNA, which you label with a green dye. And you hybridize these to a microarray. And then what you see on the microarray is that DNA gain, you'll have more red than you would green, so you end up with a red spot. And if you have DNA loss, you end up with more green than you would red, so you end up with a, red, a green spot. Sorry. If there is no change, you end up with a yellow spot. There's then a bit of a black box step, which makes this really difficult to understand by the medical students, interestingly. Um, but essentially, all this computer is doing is measuring the fluorescent signals that you see on the microarray and then plotting it out for you. This is the sort of plot that you'd actually see. It's not one of these three um, little girls. But this is just a useful plot because what it enables us to do is illustrate how you can translate a DNA sample into looking at what genes are actually involved here. So this shows gain on chromosome 17Q, so the long arm of chromosome 17Q, and then there is loss on 17Q as well. But what we can actually then do is use a genome browser to look at precisely what genes are in this region. So of course, before the Human Genome Project, this wasn't possible. You couldn't do it because you didn't know what genes were actually present in, these re in this region. So you can see exactly what genes have been gained in this region and also exactly what genes have been lost. Other ways of investigating children would have been standard single gene sequencing. We still do this, but it requires a precise clinical diagnosis. Because this is an NHS service, we do it sequentially, one gene at a time. It's very time consuming and it is relatively expensive at about £800 per gene. Many of you who have ever done any um, gene sequencing will probably remember the old radiographs that we used to use um, involving uh, radioactively labelled probes used in Sanger sequencing. We still do Sanger sequencing, but these days we use fluorescently labelled probes and you end up with a readout that looks something like this that you can then just simply read off the top. So where have we really got to with all of this? Well, initially we used light microscopy. You could see entire chromosomes. Then we could use G-banded karyotypes, which gave us five to 10 megabases resolution. And I've got as far as microarrays, which gives us 50 to 100 kilobases of re resolution. But where we really are now is whole exome and whole genome sequencing, which takes us down to one base pair. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about the 100,000 Genomes Project. This grew out of the 2012 legacy. And it is an NHS program designed to bring benefit to patients. The way it's structured is that there are essentially two arms um, in the 100,000 Genome Project. And there is the rare disease arm, which is precisely where these little girls would end up. And the idea behind the rare disease arm is that essentially it's a gigantic fishing exercise. Um, if you have several children who are affected by the same sort of thing, then you can run a genome and see whether or not they have mutations in the same sort of genes. My patients in cancer genetics would end up in the rare disease arm if, for example, they have four or five people affected with breast cancer under the age of 50. But they may also end up in the common cancer arm. And the idea really behind the common cancer arm is all to do with treatment. If you have a whole bunch of people who all are affected with, say, melanoma, for example, and you find that they all have the same mutation 
within their cancer, then what you may be able to do is design a drug that treats that particular mutation. Melanoma is actually a great example of this because um, the first drug really designed um, in this way was a drug called Vemurafenib, which treats the BRAF mutation um, common in melanomas. I suppose this idea is very much along the same lines as um, treating bacterial infections with antibiotics. What you really want to do is to work out what is different about your bacterium from your human in order that you can kill your bacterium and not your human. The idea in designing cancer drugs is very much the same. We know that cancers have their own genomes and therefore if you can work out what's different about certain cancers, you may be able to design a drug that is effective against those cancers but causing relatively few side effects. And obviously this is the genome project. So back to our dysmorphic kids. Um, well, these three little girls were investigated by karyotyping. They were investigated by fish and they were investigated by array CGH and nothing whatsoever was found. But they were then put forward for whole exome sequencing. Um, and as you can see from this paper, um, mutations were um, detected. They've actually got a mutation in a gene called CLP1. So let's think about what the advances have been in cancer genetics. And I'm going to talk to you just for a few minutes about familial breast cancer. I always use this slide when I'm talking about um, women with breast cancer. Really, I suppose, in tribute to all of the fantastic women I've seen over the years who, whilst undergoing chemotherapy for breast cancer, have been doing the shopping, have taken the kids to school, have put their best clothes on and their heels and their makeup and their earrings and have frankly just got on with it. So, familial breast and ovarian cancer Breast cancer in Caucasian women in the UK is really common. One in eight of us are going to get it. Because breast cancer is really common, lots of families will have more than one case. Back in 1866, there was a paper by a uh, broker and colleagues, which was, I think, the first paper to observe that family history did increase the risk for individuals. But the BRCA genes weren't actually isolated until the mid-1990s. So if we think about this in the context of 1999, NHS genetic testing was in its infancy. Results were taking more than a year to come back. What we were looking for was BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. Now, 90 to 95% of breast cancer is sporadic. Only 5 to 10% is genetic. BRCA1 and BRCA2 do account for most of the genetic cases and they do confer a huge risk. If you think about general population risk as being about 10%, women with these mutations have up to an 85% lifetime risk of developing a breast cancer. These genes function as DNA repair genes and interestingly there are founder mutations seen. The most common one of these is in the Ashkenazi Jewish population, um, but there are also found mutations in the Icelandic population, and there is a Yorkshire mutation. So how were these genes discovered? Well, the US company Myriad sequenced DNA from around 20,000 individuals in families with a strong family history, and discovered that many of these mutations, many of these individuals have mutations in the same gene, which they called breast cancer gene number one, BRCA1. Of the remainder, many had mutations in another gene, which they called BRCA2. Now, the tricky bit about this was that Myriad then patented both genes. This was something done fairly commonly uh, back in the mid-90s. And 
But what it meant for patients was that you could only cover part of BRCA1 and BRCA2 in the DNA sequencing that was available in the NHS. So if you found a mutation, that was fine. You knew what you were dealing with. You could advise your patient accordingly. But if you didn't find a mutation, that was really inconclusive um, for the patients at that time. Now, I've shown you this pedigree before, but it's important to really think about what is going on in these families. You've essentially got people dying from breast and ovarian cancer at very young ages. You've got men affected with breast cancer. The incidence of breast cancer in the general population for men is about one in 10,000. If you have a BRCA mutation, your risk can go up as high as 10 to 15%. What do we know now that we didn't know then? Well, we know that BRCA1 and BRCA2 are still the big players here. But we do know that there are a whole bunch of other genes that are contributing to familial aggregation of breast cancer. And then, of course, there's this area over here where there's a whole bunch of other things that we actually don't yet know about. What we're able to do now is to offer panel testing. And we can now test all of the genes that I told you about in the previous slide. And this is really useful because we can identify other breast cancer predisposition genes in affected individuals in order to be able to advise them about their risks and also other family members. If you test a whole panel in an individual who has been affected at a very young age with breast cancer and you don't find something, we're no longer in a situation where we go, well, there might be something there, but we weren't able to test that bit of the genes. Actually, we can, with a much greater level of certainty, um, tell people that there's probably not much there to find if we don't find a mutation on panel testing. I've got an example here of why panel testing is really useful. We had a lady LH referred to us who was 28 years old and had been diagnosed with breast cancer. She had a strong family history of cancer and we did BRCA1 and BRCA2 um, at the time of diagnosis and no mutations were found. This is what her family history looked like and you can see down here, this is her. Mum was diagnosed with breast cancer at 42 and there is a maternal great aunt here diagnosed at 48 and another maternal um, great aunt diagnosed at the age of 38. Her father was diagnosed with gastric cancer at the age of 62, but he was adopted, that's what these brackets mean, and there's no information at all about his side of the family. What we actually found in this lady on panel testing was that she has a mutation in a gene called PALB2, which I'll tell you about a little bit in a minute. But interestingly, her mother did not carry that mutation. So we were able to go on and do some further testing for the family um, involving mum. It's likely, therefore, that the um, PALB2 mutation may well have come down dad's side of the family. So what's PALB2? Well, PALB2 is the partner and localizer of BRCA2, works in the same DNA repair pathway as BRCA2 does. There's not that much information out there yet about what the cancer risks in PALB2 are. But we do know that the breast cancer risks seem to be of the order of 33 to 58%. Remember, general population risk, about 10%. There seems to be a slight increased risk of ovarian cancer. And interestingly, there have been mutations in PALB2 patients, in people with pancreatic cancers, gastric cancers, so our lady's dad may be relevant here, and also melanomas. So how is genomics impacting on cancer genetics? Well, again, I'm going to use a case to um, illustrate this. I was asked to see two siblings who were being seen, I think the family was in the children's hospital almost weekly at this point, because we had Kay, who was 11 at the time, um, and she'd been diagnosed with a germ cell tumour. And G, who was 14, who'd been diagnosed with a Ewing sarcoma. 
Now, we had done some investigations in this family. We'd had a look at the TP53 gene because that was probably the most likely gene um, involved in the pathology here. We'd also had a look at a rare um, gene called DISA1, but nothing whatsoever had been found. Both parents and all grandparents were alive and well. And so we put the family forward for whole genome sequencing and we collected samples from both affected children, their unaffected sister and both parents. And we found a pathogenic mutation in a gene called FH. So FH gene mutations cause a rare condition called hereditary leiomyomatosis renal cell cancer syndrome, which as its name suggests, causes aggressive renal cancers and skin leiomyomas. It can also cause uterine fibroids and occasional cardiac, cardiac anomalies. But importantly, it doesn't cause germ cell tumours and it doesn't cause Ewing sarcomas. Just so that you've got an idea of what skin leiomyomas look like close up, they look like this. And we often see them in this kind of distribution. You can sometimes get this sort of patchy distribution on the skin. The important thing about these leiomyomas is that you need to keep a bit of an eye on them. They occasionally turn into leiomyosarcomas. But more importantly, they are really painful, these things, particularly in extreme hot or extreme cold. And um, the dermatologists often treat these using um, alpha blockers. So back to the family, we found a mutation in what is essentially the wrong gene. The question is, how on earth do we interpret this? Well, the first question to ask is, is this a real pathogenic mutation and not a polymorphism? Yes, it is. Is there anything in the family to suggest that actually they do have this condition? No, there isn't. There's nobody with any odd painful skin lesions and there's nobody with any uterine fibroids. But does it segregate with disease? Well, yes, because both affected children do carry the mutation. The unaffected sister doesn't carry it. Mum carries it and dad doesn't. So what we then needed to do was to talk to this family in detail. Um, we found a mutation which may explain the cancers in the kids. We definitely know it's a pathogenic mutation. But we know that these, type of can these types of cancer haven't been described before in association with mutations in this gene. So essentially what we may be doing is extending the phenotype of HLRCC. What do we mean by extending the phenotype? Well, if you think about people described with mutations in FH, they all had kidney cancers or skin lymphomas. People haven't been investigated who didn't have kidney cancers or skin leiomyomas to see whether or not they had HLRCC. So it may be that mutations in the fumarate hydratase gene, which causes HLRCC, can actually cause a whole bunch of other things. And it may be, therefore, that what we are able to do in doing genomic analysis in these families is to find out an awful lot more about the phenotype that we thought was quite narrow and actually turns out to be quite a lot wider. But at the patient level, we now know that these kids are at increased risk of renal cancers and will need surveillance and that mum is as well. So I think really what we've learned from this case is that genomic data often doesn't yield readily interpretable results. We did find a mutation in essentially the wrong gene. And that time and expertise in clinical genetics are needed to convey these results to families. I don't think it's feasible to expect that this is part of standard oncology care. Oncologists are not really able to interpret all of these results in the context of a standard oncology appointment. And I think also oncologists have a much different emphasis from what we have in genetics. I had a conversation with um, an oncologist at the Hill who shall remain nameless and essentially what he said to me that day was, Lisa, you know, all of this stuff that you do is terribly, terribly interesting. 
But if a gene doesn't mean that I can throw a different drug at it, I'm not terribly interested in it. And I think that's really the kind of, historically, that's really been the kind of mindset of most oncologists. You know, if a gene doesn't affect treatment, they're not particularly interested in it. But actually, those of us in cancer genetics can then provide the backup to all of this um, and help the patients in a slightly different way. So what do we do in the Oxford Medical course now that we didn't do when I graduated back in 1999? Well, as you might imagine, there's been a bit of course expansion gone on. Back in 1999, we studied things like Down syndrome. Um, we studied things like sickle cell anemia. We did linkage analysis. You can see the equations down here for LOD scores. And we even ventured into the murky world of Bayes' theorem. But we did spend quite a lot of time doing Mendel and Pease. And one almost felt like saying, Brother Mendel, we grow tired of Pease. What we're able to do now, though, is a little bit more. Well, quite a lot more, actually. Cancer genetics was still in its infancy back in, in 1999. Nowadays, it forms more than half of the referrals to clinical genetics departments. So we do do quite a lot of cancer genetics. In the lectures that I give to the first year medical students throughout the university, we do still talk about chromosomal disorders. They are still important. Increasingly, we're talking about polygenic diseases. But we spend quite a lot of time talking about reproductive choice. Prenatal diagnosis, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, and the ethical considerations that all of this really throws up. You know, what kind of God are we playing? And are, is this really designer babies? Or is this really just being pragmatic? Increasingly, we're spending more time on genomics, which of course throws up much more ethical discussions. Medical education in Oxford has evolved. I stole this from my husband, um, who was also an Oxford medical student. And um, you can see that the pathology uh, practical class notes in 1989 featured a very small furry animal. I don't think we'd be allowed to do that these days, um, but I think this probably does date from a time when some would say one was still allowed a sense of humour. These days, literally these days, in Trinity term 2020, that was one typical week um, in the middle of May. You can see that we were doing all of our tutorials on Microsoft Teams. And you know, it worked. It wasn't ideal. But due to COVID, it was the only choice we had. So I think if you count up the number of tutorials I gave on a screen that week, I think it was seven. But what does it look like when we don't have a pandemic going on? Well, this is a slide that um, I use in the open days because I find the prospective applicants are very confused as to what the interaction is between the university centrally and the college. It's still mostly arranged by the university, but in the colleges, we still give the tutorials and we are still able to give personalized attention to each student. So what's the same? Well, the basic course structure is, is exactly the same. We still have five terms for our first BM and it's still very much focused on a basic science training. It's still four terms for FHS and you then still go to clinical school. But there are some subtle structure changes. To everyone's great relief, the first BM exams are now after Easter in year two. For those of us who took them in ninth week of Hillary term in year two, that was awful. 
and having them after Easter gives the students six weeks to revise the content. Exams have two parts. There is a first part known as the part A, which is a multiple choice exam. And that covers the material which has been determined by the General Medical Council that all medical students have to know. The second part is still an essay paper. And this gives the, opp the opportunity to the students to be able to explore things in much more depth than, than they have to um, for part A. We now have more options for the final honours school. Um, until recently, this was four options or five options that you could then mix and match themes within those options to study um, subjects in depth. As you'll see from um, a subsequent slide, we now have many more options. I'm going to talk about the clinical school um, in much more detail on a subsequent slide. But we have also introduced subjects such as sociology and psychology at preclinical level, which certainly weren't present when I was a medical student. Students now don't undertake dissection. Um, personally, there are prosections. And I think that this is probably an improvement. Um, I vividly remember being at Oriel as a preclinical student and going back to college for lunch. On Mondays and Wednesdays, nobody would sit next to the preclinical medical students because we all stank a formalin. Interestingly, a couple of years ago, I had to go back to the dissecting room um, because we needed a sample from one, a patient who was the mum of one of the patients that I'd been seeing in clinic. This lady had had kidney cancer and she had um, graciously donated her body to the medical school for use in dissection. What was really interesting for me 20 years later was walking into the dissecting room and immediately I felt as though I was a first year medical student all over again. The smell was the same. I said I'd talk about final honours school. Um, I think this is a massive improvement personally. Um, Students are now required to pick two of these to study in final honour school. I think if this was me now, I would probably have picked infection and molecular pathology. Whereas previously infection was lumped with immunology, which was always a bit of a foreign language. So I wouldn't have picked that. But if you can now do infection and molecular pathology, that is really um, a huge improvement. The students seem to really like it, actually. They can now study the areas that they are most interested in. I said that I would talk about the Oxford Clinical School. Um, one of the things that I hope you're aware of is that the Oxford Clinical School is the best in the UK. Balliol's doing really well. Um, I think last year we were judged the second best college for support of its clinical students. Perennially, it seems that we're judged the second best college and perennially, it seems that we, we lose out to Jesus. I suppose it's an occupational hazard. Prior to 2015, and um, certainly in the era of most of the people listening to this talk, I would imagine, there were, the entry to clinical school was highly competitive. The numbers made it so. We had 150 Oxford students at preclinical level. Then we had 45 graduate entry medical students who all funneled into the clinical course after a year of graduate entry. And then we had about 30 coming in from the Fens, i.e. Cambridge, only for 150 places. If you start doing the maths there, you can work out that even though most students did want to stay, some wanted to go to London, some were unable to. These days, there is no absolute guarantee that students will get in. But really what precipitated the change is that Cambridge now accommodates all of its preclinical medical students. So we don't get Cambridge transfers anymore. Some people do still wish to transfer to London. And the maths these days means that you are 
almost guaranteed a place. Now, if you have stabbed somebody during your preclinical years, as we see occasionally at Christchurch, um, you may not get into clinical school. If you failed all of your exams, then you may not get into clinical school. So we are still asking people to reapply in year three of the course, but you are pretty well guaranteed a place. Everybody in Balliol who has wanted to stay has been able to. I thought it was important to put this slide up really to kind of acknowledge um, the tutors. Everyone will recognize Piers Nye, an absolute legend um, in many ways. My predecessor was Peter Cole, who moved on to um, Imperial. And I'd also like to acknowledge um, Gillian Morris Kay, of whom more in, a, in one slide's time. Many people rec recognise Henry McQuay, who used to look after our clinical students, David Dressler, who taught biochemistry, and then jo um, Jacqueline McLaren and Jonathan Meekins, who again were involved in teaching the clinical students within Balliol. One of the things I think you'll see from this slide is that we're a bit more diverse than we used to be. There's an awful lot more women on, on this slide. And there's also a lot more diversity. Just to take you through things, um, this is me without um, lockdown hair. My colleague Manuela Zaccolo, who replaced um, Piers Nye. Victoria Bahu, who teaches neuroscience here in Balliol. Ayla Baruchu, um, who teaches psychology to our medical students and also to our um, biomedical scientists. Martin Burton, who looks after our clinical students and who is shortly to become um, Vice Master Executive. Tom Koska, who heads up anatomy teaching here in um, Balliol, but actually also heads up anatomy teaching across the university. Robin Chowdhury, um, who many of you may remember as a contemporary, um, who is now a um, fellow looking after our biomedical sciences graduates here in Balliol. And Autumn Rowan, who teaches um, embryology and histology to our medical students. Not missing out Gillian. Now Gillian has been teaching in Balliol off and on forever. She retired but was persuaded to come out of retirement in recent years um, to teach Balliol's medical students. And we are immensely grateful to Gillian for coming out of retirement um, and doing that for us. The students, of course, as ever, think she's brilliant. Reassuringly, I'm going to finish with this. There's, there's always been more to life than work. Um, you will be able to spot your lecturer if you look very closely in this particular Osler crew from 1997. Um, we rode over as head of the river and we were also finalists in Henry, Henley Women's Regatta. But the rowing tradition seems to be continuing. In 2015, um, Beatty, who you can see just here, um, was a third year medic. She managed to get a first. And more recently, Charlotte Lee, one of our fourth year medics, and Leah Mitchell, third year biomedical scientist, have represented Oxford in this year's lightweight um, women's boat race. Interestingly, we've recently got Leah's results. She also got a first. She was also um, JCR president and president of the Oxford University Women's Lightweight uh, Rowing Club. What you can see here, I hope, in an illustration of my first year medics and biomedical scientists, and also my second year medics, is that the stereotypes are gone. According to what is written in the press very commonly, there are no black and minority ethnic students in Oxford. I hope that this slide 
will enable you to reassure people that that's no longer the case. Thank you very much.